I don't even know how long she's been gone. It's like I've woken up in bed and she's not here. Because she's gone to the bathroom or something. But somehow I just... I just know she's never going to come back to bed. If I could just reach over and touch her side of the bed, I would know that it was cold. But I can't. I know I can't have her back. But I don't want to wake up in the morning thinking she's still here. I lie here not knowing how long I've been alone. So how, how can I heal? How am I supposed to heal if I can't feel time? Hello movie lovers, welcome home. My name is Amy Henserling and you're listening to Watch This List. My name is Amy Henserling, and I'm an alcoholic. My name is Amy Henserling, and today I am 275 days clean. April 4th, 2024. The last time I had a drink was on July 4th, 2023. Champagne in a Christmas mug while watching Jaws. Remember Sammy Jenkins. Remember Amy Henserling. She has an alcoholic condition condition where she forgets who she is and she does the same things over and over again that don't work and she trusts the wrong people and she forgets how she got from one place to the other until someone says Oh, yeah. You were in the shower and then you came out and then five hours later we woke you up. But you don't remember. You said some funny things and we couldn't tell. Was I having fun? Did I make people laugh? Maybe I should consult my Polaroids in my pocket. Sammy Jenkins, he had a system. You have to have a system that works. You have to be able to take notes. You have to be wary of other people. Amy was my first real challenge. Sammy was my first real challenge. It's interesting, isn't it, that Nolan structures the black and white at the very beginning against what we see in modern day as though they're two different selves, right? The past self and the present self, except... Leonard doesn't know who he is in any time because he answers the phone and tells the story about Sammy and doesn't know that he's talking about himself. And then at the end, Teddy gives this great exposition and we don't even know if we can trust him either because he's definitely a liar and he's definitely using him. But it's like every other sentence may or may not be the truth. 
Nothing ever sticks with you. Nothing ever sticks like this won't stick. You don't want the truth. You make up your own truth. Why would I do that? To create a puzzle you could never solve. Why would you get blackout drunk, Amy? Why can't you just stop? Why can't you just take one? I don't understand. Hmm. Can I just let myself forget what you've told me? Can I just let myself forget what you've told me? We all lie to ourselves to be happy. Memento is a powerful film because the condition is put in such a way as to make Leonard a sympathetic character. But in actuality, it's what he does in response to his condition that makes him sick. What was done to him was unfair and violent and terrible and tragic. But his trauma response was very similar to Bruce Greenwood's in Exotica, right? To create this very rigid routine in order to cope. And one could argue that Leonard had to do it because of his condition. But he stuck firmly in the past. And doesn't have access to the truth. Which is that he already killed the guy. That his vengeance was already served. And when Teddy says that he took that picture because he was so happy and he thought for sure he'd remember this time, for sure he'd remember. And of course he didn't. So he had to lie to himself and then Teddy lied to him too. And Natalie lied to him and everybody's using him, including himself. And he's in this endless loop of thinking that he has this grand, almost chivalrous purpose, and it's utterly meaningless. And one could argue that it was meaningless, even when he killed the right guy. When you get sober and you stop the loop and the routine, usually because something is forcing you to look at it, not because you choose to, you start feeling things. You start feeling your feelings, as they say. And they're painful. And you realize that one of the reasons you drank in the first place was so that you wouldn't have to feel anything. Even though the paradox there is that the drinking is what causes chaos in your life, you lose spatial awareness, you lose sense of boundaries, you become a version of yourself that's fabricated because it's manufactured. It's you, but it's also wildly not you because you're not choosing to act that way. So it's like coming out of this haze. And the way that Leonard is in this movie is like, it's not exactly a haze in the same sense, but it's very willful. Like he, 
he cannot for an instant let go of his objective. And it's literally tattooed on his body. It's literally all in his surroundings. It's in his pockets. It's what he's carrying. Every object, every sound is related to this one thing, this one idea. And I can't help but link all of this to how it feels to be trapped in alcoholism, how it feels to be trapped in addiction, that (laughs) you wake up in the morning thinking about drinking, whether it's when am I going to drink? What am I going to drink? How long should I wait to drink? I don't want to drink. Okay, I do want to drink, but I don't want to admit that I want to drink. And I also don't have any more drinks, so I need to go to the store to buy more, but I don't want to buy so much that it looks like that I drink a lot. But then I kind of wish that I could buy so much so that I wouldn't have to go to the store again and buy more. And all day long, you're thinking about drinking. And then when you're drinking, you wish that you weren't. But then the whole day ends up being about that one thing. So every time that Guy Pierce strolls up into the scene and you know that he's going to say, I have this condition. I'm sorry. Have we met before? I'm sorry if we've had this conversation before. I need to do it face to face. I can't be on the phone. It's the same sort of repetition, rinse, reuse, repeat system. Except in Leonard's case, it's external. And when you've gotten to the point of progression where you're hiding what you're doing, it's all a back and forth conversation in your mind like you're crazy. Maybe sometimes you even talk to yourself out loud about it. Because half of this habit is secrecy. And you think when you're doing it that you're actually being honest with yourself. You think that you have a handle on it and that you're really smarter. But try to stop. Try to stop for longer than you've ever tried to stop. Let's say that the longest you've ever gone without drinking is two weeks which is generous for most of us. Try to stop for three. And I'm going to go a step further than that. And this could apply to anything that you feel has a hold on you. And all of us know what that thing is. If you try to interrupt the pattern, if you try to do something different, And then the day that your time goal is done, if the second after after it's done, you go back to it immediately, that'll tell you that you've got a problem. And you can rationalize all day long, and the best of us do. One of the things that always strikes me is when when I meet an alcoholic in recovery, how smart they are. Not just smart, intellectual, sharp, successful people. So if you think, no, it can't be me. I have a job. I go to that job. My job's not in danger. I've never done blank, fill it. I've never gotten a DUI. I've never been to jail. I've never been so drunk that I didn't know where I was. Okay, except for this one time, but that was in Mexico, or that was on vacation, and those times don't count. No, Leonard. You already did that, but that wasn't enough because you didn't remember. So then you killed this other guy and then this other guy. Why don't you go in the basement and see how many bodies you have down there? 
No, Leonard, it was your wife who had diabetes. It was your wife who went insane. How can I make it so I don't remember what you told me? Can I just let myself forget what you've said? There's just signs everywhere that are trying to help us. And I think at the beginning, maybe they're subtle. Because it's not going to be in your face until it gets real bad. But they are always there. Maybe you shouldn't do this. Maybe you shouldn't do this. Maybe you'd be happier if you stopped this. I'm going to read you guys two things. And then we're going to talk about Nolan. This first one is by Richard Rohr from his book called Breathing Underwater, which is all about spirituality and the 12 steps. And this is the part I highlighted that made me think of Memento and what I wanted to say. We just can't see what we are not forced to see. The whole deceptive game is that we seem to need something to force us to deal with that log in our eye. For many, if not most, people, the only thing strong enough to force them is some experience of addiction, some moral failure, or some falling over which they are powerless. We are all powerless, however, and not just those physically addicted to a substance. Alcoholics just have their powerlessness visible for all to see. The rest of us disguise it in different ways and overcompensate for our more hidden and subtle addictions and attachments, especially our addiction to our way of thinking. We all take our own pattern of thinking as normative, logical, and surely true, even when it does not fully compute. We keep doing the same thing over and over again, even if it's not working for us. That is the self destructive nature of all addiction, and of the mind in particular. We think we are our thinking, and we even take that thinking as utterly true, which removes us at least two steps from reality itself. We really are our worst enemies, and salvation is primarily from ourselves. It seems humans would sooner die than change, or admit that they are mistaken. That is how far the ego will go to promote and protect itself. It would sooner die than change. It's, it would sooner live in a win-lose world in which most lose than allow God any win-win victory. Grace is always a humiliation for the ego. What made me think of that passage particularly is how stubborn Leonard is. That even when he's given evidence throughout the film that his note-taking is a flawed system, that in certain instances he can't even trust his own handwriting, that he can be manipulated and controlled by his own means, Teddy's been doing this for him for God knows how long and knows how to push his buttons. He knows exactly what to say. So Leonard's God is this way of operating. And he has all these lofty statements about facts and that he trusts facts and he knows certain certainties. Like when he knocks on the desk, he knows what it's going to sound like. And when he picks up the piece of glass, the glassware, he knows what it feels like in his hand. 
And he thinks that because he remembers his wife so vividly, that that makes her real in the present tense. But none of this works for him. He's just stuck. And he has an addiction to the past. Second thing I'm going to read you from This Is How by Augustine Burroughs. He writes, For many years, I believed that one's past had to be fully understood in order to move through and beyond it. I see now that I was wrong about this. I know now that scrutinizing one's past and trying to gain understanding and make peace with it is a kind of addiction that keeps one focused on the past and not on the present. As with, as with any attachment, the first step to overcoming it is to see it. And once you see it, you have to stop it. The past does not haunt us. We haunt the past. We allow our minds to focus in that direction. We open memories and examine them. We re-experience emotions we felt during the painful events we experienced because we are recalling them in as much detail as we can. We enter therapy and discuss our past. We formulate opinions about what happened. We create a rich, detailed story. In therapy or on our own, we focus our attention on something that no longer exists in order to understand or have perspective or acknowledge or own what has happened. And only after we decide this understanding or recognition has taken place, do we stop worrying that particular tooth with our tongue. Sometimes a particular trauma may be the largest thing we have ever experienced. So we kind of move into it, make it our home. Because there's nothing in our lives on the scale of that loss or that trauma. So you need a larger life. Something that can successfully compete with your past. To live with your mind in the past in the name of healing or understanding or overcoming is to live in a fantasy world where nothing new or original is created. To understand one understand one's past is to handle clay that no longer exists and shape it into a bowl nobody can ever touch or see. Most of the conversations that I have on a daily basis now and most of the stories that I hear in the room are about being free from blame and taking responsibility. People genuinely being freed from some of the worst things that you've ever heard in your life. People who were abused as children or teenagers, abused period, in ways that I feel like are unforgivable if they happen to me. People who were drunk and got into an accident and killed somebody. People who went to prison, who lost their spouses, whose children won't ever talk to them again and can't forgive them, whose parents were abusive alcoholics and then they were abusive alcoholic parents to their children and other children are addicts. But these are the happiest people that I've ever known. And it's miraculous and it's inspiring. And 
I can promise you that whatever satisfaction you receive from anything that you're doing that's hurting you is not a is smaller than a grain of sand compared to the clarity and the life that you could have if you asked for help and were able to give it up. I've had this podcast for a year and a half now. And a lot of it I do for fun because I know that you guys enjoy it. And I love meeting my letterbox friends in real life and over video. But this is the stuff that matters to me. And this is the stuff that I want to say. And movies that remind me of what it looks like to die slowly like this. Like the recent Love Lies Bleeding, where I'm so aware now of noticing patterns and habits and spirals into darkness, and those are dark places, right? They're dark places. When you're trying to quit smoking while you're listening to a cassette on how bad nicotine is, and you're still smoking. And you probably hate yourself for smoking, which is why you're listening to the tape. And it could be anything, could be anything that you feel like, that you feel like you can't pass by of your own free will, or that you just find yourself caught up in, no matter the strength of your resolve. So Christopher Nolan makes Memento. He made it like a film noir. He said that the black and white scenes were documentary style because he wanted you, he wanted us as the audience to feel like we could get to know Leonard on his own terms in a different way than he is in the present. I listened to the entire director's commentary on the film, even though Nolan hates doing commentaries and probably will never do one again. (laughs) And quite frankly, isn't that great at it, but he's just such a technical director that after I listened to it, I got the impression that the person who's really responsible for Leonard's depth and character development was Guy Pierce. Because a lot of the things that ended up being filmed were at his insistence. The monologue, how can I heal if I don't fill time, was originally several pages long. Guy Pierce was like, nope, we need to cut this thing way down. It's at the heart of the film, but it's still only a minute and a half about. And he was right to do that, I think. The part when they show the accident and he's knocked down to the ground and his head is bleeding out was also Guy Pierce's idea because he wanted it to look like his mind was leaking and that his past self was dead. Nolan was fascinated by the idea of Leonard's past self and his present self conversing. He said, quote, I was fascinated by the idea that somebody who could not create these memories would essentially be divided by the past self and the present self. That connection between those two aspects of himself would be broken. So 
so <laughs> it's just such a rich metaphor really for how we operate the kicker here is that Leonard almost has the mercy of not having to be present for everything. It's almost like he's been given a gift that he isn't fully conscious because if he was like he is at the end of the film, that moment of like total clarity as Teddy's explaining and we are learning the truth as Leonard's learning the truth and then he burns the Polaroids and he writes himself a note to completely derail himself on purpose. The one time that he has a chance, he sabotages himself completely. And I read that as a person who wants to be stuck in denial because clarity's too painful and it would eliminate his perception of his own usefulness. My dear friend Dan, when we were talking about it, said that he felt that it was a moment of agency for the character that he was taking some control back. Even though it was a violent end, it was like he was standing up for himself for the first time. I think either way, that idea of or that focus of obsession with male grief is just, it just permeates all of his actions. It's the same thing in Inception and Oppenheimer and Interstellar. There's this intense underlying sadness of loss and just being pulled back and pulled back and pulled back, you know into the hole. One thing I thought was interesting that Nolan pointed out was that the final scene was one of several similar conversations that Teddy has had, but Lenny appears to be having it for the first time and the information is life-changing for him, but monotonous for Teddy. <laughs> it reminds me of how People who live with addicts are just so over it, right? Over the behavior, over the lies and the consequences and the, you said you were going to quit. You said you were going to quit. You said you were going to quit. And that's in situations where they actually know that something's going on. But it's that same sort of exasperation that Teddy has the entire time. You know? He wants to help him, but this is a person who refuses to live in reality and uses his condition as a crutch for staying that way. And that's another thing that I used to do. Well... I drank because I was depressed, because it was cold outside, because I was alone, because when I prayed for the first time in my life, I couldn't hear God, because I'd gotten broken up with, because I was working at a job where I didn't use my degree. Because, because, because. There's literally any reason on earth to do it. 
or to tell yourself that it's okay. It's just so hard to see. And that line that he says that I've repeated four times now, where really, to me, what the film comes down to is that line of like, I'm going to make myself forget that you gave me truth. So it's another reason why, (laughs) at least for me, when I would go places or be at parties, never want to drink alone, right? And if you can find somebody who would drink with you, you just feel, ah, it just feels so much better, right? It's that instant relief, like, oh, thank God. It's not just me. And you think that you just are doing that because it's more fun or because that person is going to be more laid back and your small talk doesn't have to be so such a drag, so belabored, right? But it really is so that you... so that that shame and that heaviness can be alleviated for a little bit because if someone else is doing it, then it isn't just you. One thing a friend of mine told me recently is that breaking a pattern and breaking a routine is not about accepting circumstances. It's about knowing who you are standing up for yourself, being okay with rejection because you're no longer rejecting yourself. You want to try to build a life you don't have to run away from. And that's something that sobriety does. Getting sober means going where the pain is now and being concerned about its healing now. Not escape, not band-aids, not temporary solvents. It's where is the pain coming from? What is it saying? And you can't even begin to ask those questions if you're in your loop. It keeps bringing you back to Exotica. It's about doing something different, doing something else. getting kicked out of the club. And we need help doing that, you know. I find it so fascinating now that I've been in meetings for nine months, how Someone could sit there. They could sit there every single day. They could go seven days a week. They could go multiple times a day and not hear a single thing and not understand a single thing. And then one day they go like they always go and something is said that makes sense. And it's like a switch that's just flipped. And maybe you don't understand everything, but you understand something, which is more than nothing. And it makes you reflect. It makes you want to reflect. 
and assess your current circumstances. And not just believe the lies that you tell yourself. But nobody can make anybody ready. And that's the thing that's the hardest about life, right? I couldn't make myself be ready. No one could have made me ready. And nobody can keep me ready either. It's all this within, without, delicate balance. That powerlessness that Roar is talking about. That we all have. It's just, it's easy to feel you're in control if your life is quote unquote manageable, if you're functioning. But what is that life? It's where you can't think about anything else. Leonard will never be able to stop thinking about catching a killer that he already killed. How much of your brain space is dedicated to a single subject that doesn't improve your life? If you had to quantify it, if you actually stopped to calculate it, or even started talking about it. Because that's the thing that happens too. When I stopped drinking, I started talking. And I was desperate to be guided and led and encouraged, and I would have done anything. If someone had told me that I could have felt less pain by doing 20 jumping jacks on the side of the road, I would have done it. I would have done anything. But after that sort of fades a little bit and you start to get your equilibrium back, what you then want is you want to learn how to talk, how best to talk. How can you be vulnerable with everyone that you meet? How can you love the truth and yearn for it? How can you offer to be there to people who aren't ready yet without trying to convince them that there's a solution because you can't look for a solution if you don't think you have a problem. There's a TikTok video I remember seeing where Ben Affleck was being interviewed and (laughs) he was talking about how annoying it was when he would go to AA and There were people there saying that they were grateful that they were alcoholics and they were grateful for their disease and he would get so pissed off and he'd be like, you know, fuck you. Um, All I'm trying to do in my life is, you know, I'm like I'm barely hanging by a thread and you're telling me that you're grateful for this. But then, of course, (laughs) as with most things that piss you off at first, they just anger you because maybe you don't understand yet. And now he is grateful because pain that repeats itself and won't go away is trying to teach you something. It 
if you find yourself saying, like I did, why does this keep happening no matter what I do? This just keeps happening. But this time was different than that other time. And this other time was different than the other time. So I'm obviously, I'm not doing the exact same thing over and over. They're different every time. But then somehow, miraculously, magically, I always end up here in the same place. The question I would pose is... What happens when you don't follow the compulsion? Do you even know? Have you ever tried? Hmm. I can tell you that what has happened to me When I stopped, and trust me, quitting drinking for me was like a divorce. It was like a divorce and a death of a loved one because I was in love with my cycle. When you can get far enough away from that sort of toxic relationship, what happens is you have an opportunity to become useful. And you get your self-esteem back. something that nobody in this film remotely achieves. They're all just using each other. And that's one of the goals of recovery, is that your desire to use others is gone. So, nine months is a landmark for me, and I'm grateful that I am in a position where this podcast belongs to me and is my own, and that I can speak to you. And if you're still listening, and you can identify with anything, know that I understand. You're not alone. You're not alone at all. And there is a place where you can feel that you belong. There is a solution. Now, where was I?